Hi. Uh, my name is Brendan Scott, and I'm the historian in residence with Cavan County Council for the decade of St. Henry's programme. And this short webisode, we're going to investigate attacks made mostly on RIC and some military barracks throughout Cavan during both the War of Independence and the Civil War, and in one case uh, after the end of the Civil War as well. Um, the newspapers themselves are full of reports of attacks on both Army and RIC barracks, as are the pension files, which you can find now online, with former IRA men recounting their activities as part of their pension applications. Uh, of course, you may need sometimes to take these uh, these claims made in pension applications with a pinch of salt, uh, as perhaps exaggerations can be made. And of course, with the passage of time, people's memories can, uh, you know, can fail them on occasion as well. So sometimes you have to just be wary of that, um, just to keep an, an, an eye on that, I suppose. Um, and Dr. Brian Hughes has already looked at in detail on the attack on the barracks uh, the, in, in Arva, the RIC barracks there, on the 25th of September 1920. Uh, you can find his lecture online uh, with all the rest of the decade material uh, with Cavan County Council. Uh, and it was also his essay was also uh, published in a book that I edited a few years ago, which you can get through the library service as well, if you're interested. So there's no need to look at that particular incident again. Uh, but suffice it to say that it was certainly one of the most dramatic attacks to have taken place during the War of Independence in uh, Cavan. And just to give you some idea, like there's plenty of other things happened as well. And just to give you some idea of the scale of destruction in the county in 1920, on Saturday, the 18th of September that year, 1920, a special session was held in Calvin Courthouse to hear 53 claims for compensation as a result of malicious injury to property. Um, and that was for the half the year from January to June the 13th, 1920. So there are 53 claims and a lot of those were burnings and things like that. Uh, so it, it was, you know, that, that was quite a, an amount for six months, not even six months. Uh, the session, that session, uh, to hear those 53 claims took three days and it happened in the courthouse in Cavan. And on the first day, an armed guard was placed on the door. Members of the public weren't allowed to attend those sessions either. And so it, it gives you a good idea of the level of tension there was uh, in the county at that time. Now, the first major wave of IRA attacks on barracks began around Easter 1920, and it's there that we'll begin. So I'm going to go through some of these and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Grouse Hall Barracks, which is about six miles from Bellybar, was burned on the night of the 3rd of April, and its owner was Major Somerset Sanderson, who was one of the Sandersons from Casa Sanderson. He claimed £1,800 uh, compensation for that, uh, for the destruction of that. He only got £260. Uh, and the reason for that was it was all it was also insured. So the people said, well, you know, you're going to get the money uh, from the insurance anyway. So we're not going to give you £1,800. Uh, and then when we move on again a few weeks later to the 16th of April and the, the other end of the county in Glengevelin, uh, the IRA burned down the RIC barracks there on the 16th of April. Uh, and uh, it was described uh, in the South on the 25th of September that year, 1920, uh, the RIC barracks was described as being right in the heart of the Kingdom of Glan. Lady Ainsley, who was the owner of the Ainsleys, were landowners around there, she claimed £2,000 compensation for its loss. Now, she didn't get anything like that either. Uh, a couple of days after that, the 18th of April, Kilgola RIC barracks, which is close to the Westmeath border, not, not far from Finne, on the other side of the border, uh, it was destroyed. And its owner, a guy called Mark Stratford, he claimed £2,000 of compensation. Now, all these guys, they, they, they seem to claim more than they actually, than they're going to get, you know. So so they, they up their claim and they never, they, none of them get what they claim. But, you know, they, they, I suppose they aim high and uh, hope that you'll get something uh, around the middle, maybe. Uh, but, and he, he, so he claimed £2,000 for this place uh, in Kilgola. And it, he said he could get ten pounds a week. Um, for there was a house connected to the barracks, and he could get ten pounds a week for that house during May, uh, during the flies, uh, the fly fishing season on Loch Sheelan. and so he got nine hundred pounds compensation. So just under half of what he claimed for. And then on the first of May, nineteen twenty, it was uh, reported in the Celt. Uh, that the unoccupied police barrack at Cross Keys was set fire to on Monday night and completely gutted. Armed men took possession of the village, roused Mr. Stephen Smith from his sleep, 
and commandeered at his shop a supply of paraffin oil to the party covering him with revolvers. Subsequently, the building was seen to be in flames, the raiders remaining until the blaze was well underway. It will be recalled that an unsuccessful attempt was made on Easter Saturday night, the occasion of a simultaneous uh, attack on government buildings all over Ireland. But the villagers succeeded in extinguishing the fire before it had made headway. So there were two attempts to burn down barracks in Proskies. The first one failed, and then the second one, uh, they made sure that it was lit and the fire had taken hold. So in other words, it wouldn't be able, they wouldn't no one be able to put it out. Uh, so they were made damn sure they were going to get it this time. Uh, the guy who owned that barracks, an awful lot of these barracks were uh, uh, owned privately and were rented out uh, to uh, to the RIC. And the owner of this particular one was a guy called Thomas Lynch, and he claimed two thousand uh, pounds for it, and he claimed that he was he had received the house as a marriage settlement. 26 years previously, and since then got an annual rent of £20 from the police, um, which when you think the other guy was charging £10 a week uh, for the house uh, near Finney, it seems quite a, a disparity in rent. But anyway, when Ballyconnell Barracks was burned on the 3rd of May, it was stated again that there were armed men on the street and the shots were fired to dissuade anyone coming out to save the building. And the courthouse there was burned almost a week later on the 9th. And this is a photograph of the courthouse after it had been burned in Ballyconnell. Edward Hughes uh, also claimed uh, that his barrack, uh, the one in Gowna, when we talk about marriage settlements uh, a minute ago, Edward Hughes, who, who had the one in Gowna, owned the barrack in Gowna, he said that he had intended for this barrack to be a marriage settlement on his daughter, which obviously couldn't happen now. And he claimed £1,500 for the damage done there, and he got about half of that. Um, so so, so this guy in Gowna, Hughes, had said, well, that was to be my settlement on my daughter, that she would get the rent of this uh, barrack, and now it's been burned down. So, uh, you know, I need this uh, for my for my uh, daughter's dowry. Or something. Uh, and, and that barracks was burned down on the 10th of May. The sergeant's wife and children who were in, in the barrack, because the sergeant often lived in, if he was married, uh, and the, the sergeant's wife and kids were there. So they were brought out, they were called out, and uh, when they were safely out of the building, the building was torched and was burned down. Um, Mount Nugent's uh, RIC barracks had been vacated in December uh, 1919, and then on the 10th of May of the following year, 1920, the barracks and the courthouse were almost completely destroyed. Situated on the outskirts of the village, the barracks were visited apparently by almost 100 men in motor cars and bicycles who ordered again the sergeant's wife and family out onto the street. Oftentimes the sergeant doesn't seem to be there uh, when when uh, these attacks are being made. I'm not quite sure what, what's happening there. Um, so when these men again got the family out, they didn't burn down this one. They, they demolished it uh, with crowbars. And then they moved on to the courthouse. They broke the doors and the windows and they burned all of the documents that they could find in the courthouse, making a bonfire uh, for them on the street. Uh, a local trader, like the guy in, in Cross Keys, was woken with a request for matches. Uh, when he refused to do so, the raiders broke in the door of this guy's shop, took a barrel of oil and the, the doused the papers with the oil and uh, uh, lit it all up. Now, when we'll now go to Muller. In September 1920, uh, Simon Fitzsimons, a Dublin guy, uh, he owned the building uh, in Mulla, where the RIC were, and he claimed three and a half grand for it. And Major Sanderson, again, uh, who who we met there a while ago, uh, he had he had claimed two thousand pounds for it. Uh, Fitzsimons received six hundred seventy five pounds, and Sanderson received uh, one hundred thirty seven pounds, much less again than they had claimed. John Singleton. Uh, again, uh, that same month, claimed two and a half grand for Shercock Barracks, which had also been destroyed this time on the seventh of May. So there, there was in in uh, April, May, there was a lot of them burned, and then around uh, can, during the summer, uh, this was going on into September as well. And this is is a photograph of Barracks and Shercock after uh, it had been destroyed. Uh, Mrs. Huddy, who was the wife of the sergeant in Shercock, she stated at the hearing. Uh, that was held in September in the courthouse in Cavan, uh, that on the morning of the destruction of the barracks, she'd been given five minutes to vacate the premises 
saying that the street seemed full of men carrying rifles. Men with revolvers stopped people from leaving their houses or looking out the windows. All the roads into the town had been blocked by felled trees to prevent the authorities gaining access to the town while the attack was taking place. Um, stones from a ruined house were also used to block the road uh, to Carrick Cross. Up to 50 shots were fired into the air and into the building after it had been lit. Uh, now, Mrs. Huddy was allowed to remove a container of meal and a cradle. She had her two children with her, as she claimed, uh, and she took shelter with one Miss O'Connor, who lived next door to the barracks. Uh, Sergeant Huddy also claimed £199 uh, for furniture uh, that had been burned in the fire, which he obviously owned himself. Uh, Huddy stated that he'd taken a lot of the heavier furniture out of the barracks as a result of a warning letter that he'd received a few days previously. Uh, an earlier report states that they'd received a warning a fortnight previously. So there's a bit of a disparity there. Uh, but Huddy received, Huddy claimed 199 and he got £175 with £3 expenses for his wife, which wasn't a bad uh, return on that. The courthouse in Shercock was also burned as at the same time as the barracks, uh, with the owner, this guy Simington, claiming £550, and he got £220 with £7 and 5 shillings expenses. Generally, when the people lived in, they seemed to have gotten a better deal than the people who were just the landlord, and they seemed to have gotten better compensation deals. Um, then three years later, uh, in 1923, it was reported that the police barracks occupied by now the Civic Guard in Shercock, so during the Civil War, uh, was attacked by armed raiders who, as the, the paper said, in the course of a vigorous attack, forced the guards to surrender and leave the building, which was afterwards uh, set on fire by the raiders and burned. The house of a man named McEntee next door was also destroyed. The Civic Guard, who were, of course, unarmed, were helpless in the matter of defence so that they became easy prey to the band of armed raiders. So the one of Shercock got burned a couple of times uh, over a space of about three odd years. Now, occasionally, as I said, that that like that guy in Shercock, uh, the, the police themselves claim for loss of furniture, usually the sergeant who, as I said, oftentimes lived in uh, with his family. And um, so that happened there in Shercock, as I say. Again, in Stradone, there was a guy called Sergeant McNamara, he claimed £750 for the destruction of his furniture uh, when Stradone Barracks was burned. Sergeant Curran claimed £1,000 for the destruction of his furniture in Gauna, which we mentioned uh, Gauna got burned on the 10th of May. Uh, then the, the case in Mount Nugent was slightly different. The sergeant there, a guy called Reynolds, claimed £300 for his furniture. But the, the furniture there hadn't been burned. That barrack wasn't burned. So instead, they'd, the people attacking it sawed through the joists and let the roof fall in. The attackers then dragged out some of the furniture and burned some of it on the street, but not in the building. So only a little bit of it was, was kind of burned in that way. Uh, and he also, uh, Reynolds also claimed money for the loss of crops uh, that he had planted in the garden behind the barracks. So he claimed, I think, about £30 uh, for, for those uh, 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 crops that he'd lost out the back. So even though the, the barrack wasn't burned this time, uh, he still uh, was claiming that, that he says that a lot of his furniture was damaged in, in the roof coming in. So when the roof came down, it damaged a lot of the furniture. Some of this was then dragged out and the some of it was burned, but not much, uh, which is unlike pretty much every other uh, barrack uh, that, that we know of in the county. An interesting case then in Red Hills, the sergeant there, a guy called Mara, claimed £200 in expenses but he, dis he discussed how the attackers had actually been taken, even the bed clothes, out of the house before destroying it, out of the barrack before destroying it. And they would have saved more, only that one of the attackers lit the stairs earlier than he was supposed to. And the judge asked Mara at the session uh, for the compensation, the judge asked Mara whether the, the attackers were well disposed. In other words, you know, were they aggressive or whatever? And Mara replied that my wife made no complaint about her treatment. So in some cases, although it must have been obviously a very distressing event in, in a lot of ways, there was some degree of civility involved in it, you know, that, that they, they meant to bring more out, but then they, they, lit the, they lit the house earlier than they were supposed to, uh, so they couldn't get everything out. Uh, there was also a, a letter read out uh, in Belturbet uh, to the town council there on the 17th of May 1920 from a solicitor in Calvin representing the Crown, saying that he'd be making an application 
for compensation for £200 uh, for the burning of the barracks in Bilturbet. Uh, no comment was made by the council in response to this letter, which was recorded in the minutes, which and, and the minutes just say that the letter was be marked red. Uh, but I can guarantee you there was plenty that was said that wasn't recorded in the minutes, so I'd imagine. Anyway, then when we move on into June uh, 1920, uh, the door of Kilishandra barracks was broken by a group of drunk men, but it wasn't a proper assault. There were just a bunch of guys that had too much drink on them and they kicked in the door. Uh, so it wasn't a serious assault. It was reported that some shots were fired by the police to scare them off and that nobody was injured. Again, when we move on again into October, on the 4th of October, Dowra Courthouse and the barracks there were burned on the night of the 4th of October, 1920. It had been vacated the previous night and was burned by men who had come, as the report said, from the Leitrim direction. Dower was just on the Cavan Leitrim border. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, these guys came from, from Leitrim. Uh, now, £5,000 was claimed for this by its owners. There, there seemed to be a couple of people who had an interest in it, including a guy called Johnson, who was a prominent orange man from Bombay. And Johnson said that the courthouse had been built in 1881 by a Lord Morley, and that was used also as a hunting lodge. There was buildings attached to it. He was insured for three and a half grand, and they were awarded 3300 for that house, which was an awful lot of money. Uh, and uh, it makes me wonder whether it was because of some of the high status people that were involved, possibly, I don't know. Um, because then in, in at the same time in October that year, Lord Farnham was awarded £750 for the burning. Uh, that's Farnham there, uh, Arthur Maxwell, the 11th Lord Farnham. Uh, Farnham was awarded £750 for the burning of a disused barracks in Ardlohar. Uh, so it had been empty for a while uh, when it got burned. Uh, and sometimes there was fear sometimes that these disused barracks would be reoccupied which is why even if they were disused, they would be targeted. And that's why you have people like um, uh, like the Saunderson house, uh, the, the Casa Saunderson is occupied uh, by Crown forces. Uh, that's why Dean Finlay in Bomboy, his house was burned down uh, in 1921 in the summer uh, because uh, uh, they were afraid that the RIC were going to come in and take it over, the Black and Tans were going to take it over. And so that's how some of these terrible things uh, took place and Finley was killed in that attack. In fact, that guy Johnson I men mentioned a moment ago, uh, the, the Finley household uh, went to his house after their house was burned down and Finley was killed and they stayed with Johnson for a while until they were able to get themselves back up on their feet. But anyway, so we move on again then uh, to Kilcogee. Um, and it was burned down the RAC barracks there on the 24th of November 1920. Again, it had been vacated for six months, that one, but a rumour had gone around that it was going to be uh, reopened again. Hence the attack on what was described in the compensation hearing as being an exceptionally good building, the rent for which was £22 annually. Estimated to cost just over £2,300 to build, a decree for £608 was awarded. Again, assuming... Uh, there was some um, uh, insurance probably due on that. You'd hope anyway for the guy who owned it. But then we come to an interesting story about the, the barracks that wasn't attacked, which was the one in Bally James Duff. An attempt was made to do so on the night of the 17th of December 1920. The attacking party was to be made up of members from the Upper Lavi Company, the Cross Keys Company and the Crusher Lock Company. Communication lines were cut and preparations were made. But according to Commandant Hugh Maguire from the Crusher Lock Battalion, the men supposed to be bringing the weapons from Balanya failed to do so, and the decision was made to withdraw. There was obviously some controversy about this event because he was writing to the Anglo Celt about it in 1956, Hugh Maguire, putting his side of the story across. And he also made a statement to the same effect to the Bureau of Military History that same year, in 56. And you can read both of those in the Celt and uh, in, online and on the Bureau of Military History online as well. Now, things quietened down in terms of these attacks in 1921, mainly because most of them had been torched in 1920. And although it wasn't an attack on a barrack per se, it is worth mentioning the death of Corporal William Jacobs, who was a British soldier who'd been stationed in the Beltorbet Barrack, uh, in the military barracks there, uh, who was accidentally shot and killed in late August 1921 by a young private who was handling a revolver. This young private was reported to be almost delirious at what he had done. You can imagine the shock. Uh, of it. And Jacobs is buried in the Church of Ireland graveyard, Belturbet. You can go in and see it there. 
Now, once the 26 counties had uh, achieved the free state status, the establishment of a new police force was necessary, which, of course, is are, are, are the guards. Uh, the pre-existing uh, physical a police physical infrastructure was used in many cases and on the 3rd of June 1922 it was noted in the CELT that at the old RAC barracks about a dozen recruits were enrolled for the civic guards and after a medical examination were sent down to the there for training so uh, the, the, these old barracks uh, start getting reused again now we mentioned a non-attack in Valley Gym stuff uh, a minute ago and now we're going to go to a real attack uh, uh, on, on barracks uh, in Ballyduff, and on this happened on the night of Sunday, the second of July, nineteen twenty-two. A group of about forty to fifty anti-treaty soldiers entered houses in Ballyduff, and, stuff, and from their vantage point, made an attack on the half a dozen or so Free State soldiers who were then stationed in the barracks. There, it was recorded that rifles were used, and that the firing, understandably, caused considerable alarm among the inhabitants, who were awoken from their sleep by the noise. The soldiers in the barracks, by contrast, only had one rifle and a couple of revolvers. With these, the soldiers mounted a two-hour defence of the barracks before surrendering upon the exhaustion of their ammunition. The windows, door and roof of the barracks were quite badly damaged, along with some of the houses uh, either side of the barracks. Um, a faintly surreal aspect of the whole story uh, was that after taking the weapons and what was described as the accruitments, uh, the attackers... Uh, the uh, the anti treaty guys laid on refreshments for the garrison uh, that they'd been firing at for two hours, which is a very civilized way to end a two hour shootout. Uh, free state soldiers from the from Calvin retook the building the next day. Really, what they were interested in was taking the weapons. That was really what the guys wanted. Interestingly, another account stated that the post office had also been taken and that hand grenades had been used in the assault. Now that would have been a fairly you know, uh, tough uh, uh, attack using hand grenades, you would imagine. And although the, this uh, this example I'm going to give you now again was an attack, wasn't an attack on a barracks per se. Uh, I'll tell you about it anyway. It took place in the barracks. Edward Boylan uh, from Crusher Law was shot on Sunday, the 16th of July, 1922, when attempting to escape from Calvin Military Barracks. He'd been working as a creamery manager in Lara. He was an anti-treaty uh, irregular and he'd been arrested during the rounding up of anti-treaty forces. Uh, and it was reported that while the garrison was at dinner, Boylan surprised the guard on the main entrance and tried to take his rifle. A warning shot was fired by another guard, which Boylan ignored, uh, at which point the guard shot him through the, uh, the thigh. Uh, he was brought to the infirmary in Cavan, where the wound was dressed. and From there, he was transferred to the military hospital in Clonus. Now, although the initial report said that Boylan was making satisfactory progress, his condition soon deteriorated, and Edward Philip Boylan, who was only 21 years old, died in Clonus on the 25th of July, nine days after the shooting. And that's the civil registration of his death there. So he's a bachelor, 21, member of the IRA, gunshot wound, uh, nine days um, uh, after the thing. And uh, there was a Joseph McGowan president of death um, at the military hospital in Clonus. So it was it was a tough uh, death, and I assume we probably set the scene there or something like that. Uh, now the final story again deals with not an attack on a barrack, but rather an attack that came from a barrack. Uh, following again, as I said, the creation of the Free State in, in twenty two, uh, the army uh, temporarily occupied the military barracks in Bulturbet, where that guy had been shot uh, the previous year. And some of the Free State soldiers there decided to make their mark on the town in a way which would have been quite worrying for Unionists uh, still in Calvin, who were now separated from Great Britain, living on what was for them the wrong side of the border. On the 12th of July 1924, seven Free State soldiers attacked the Orange Hall, which was literally a stone's throw from the barracks and did quite a lot of damage to the building. Six of the soldiers were from the south of the island of Ireland, went down around Clare and down that direction and had never witnessed orange celebrations before. So on the night of the 12th and into the 13th of July, the soldiers who were drunk, as I say, uh, went to the Orange Hall and smashed it up quite a bit. Uh, it damaged some of the fittings and the case went to court where it was noted that dirt was thrown at orange banners and flags and off offensive expressions were used and the quote says the provocation was extreme. So it's almost like the soldiers were trying to goad the orange men who were probably in the hall uh, to try and kick off something, which the orange men 
realising they were outnumbered, probably these guys had guns and so on. They didn't go down that road wisely. Uh, and now the solicitor representing the Orange Order when it went to court, a guy called William Reed, stated in court that there was a good feeling in Belturbo between Catholics and Protestants, which they were keen to retain and promote. So they were kind of in an awkward position. And the judge presiding, who was presiding noted that they were all citizens of the Free State and it didn't matter whether they went to Orange, Masonic or AOH halls or any of these. They were all free to live their own lives and it would be appalling if anything like this could be tolerated. That's what the judge said. And a custodial sentence uh, for the six men, one of them had had their charges dropped, uh, could be avoided if the sum of £75 plus cost was paid, which it was. So that was that was one that came just after the Civil War, a couple of years after or a year or so after the Civil War. And um, it just shows how the tensions were still there and that even though it wasn't an attack on a barrack, the attack came from the barrack. So, again, just finishing up, just my thanks as always to Cabin County Council, especially the library service for the continued support and help. They're just brilliant people and uh, uh, they're, they're great people to work with. And again, just in particular to thank Emma Clancy, who's the county librarian, uh, Sinead McCardle and John Smith as well. And thank you all very much for watching and listening and see you all again soon, I hope. Thank you.